Chapter 5 We were on the banks of a mountain ravine. Snow water from many streams poured into the snake at this place. It came roaring down in a yellow flood. Waves reared up, and heavy mist filled the air. Here, Olicut took command. He was very tall, and had his hair cut in a roach that stuck up and made him look like a giant. He put a guard on the herds at night, and circled them himself. Soldiers camped above us on the side of the river bank and built fires. They watched to see that we crossed the river. They did not offer to help us. My father said, If General Howard had let us wait until late summer, when the water is low, then we could cross safely. Now we must struggle. Lose cattle and horses and risk our lives, Olicut said. They brought us here to drown. They planned to get rid of us forever. Ferocious Bear, a shaggy warrior from the Seven Devils country, spoke up. We should not move from this shore, he said. The soldiers wait there on the mountain to see us swept away. Let us stay and kill them. Kill one, and ten will take his place, Chief Joseph said. Tuhulhosot sat on his spotted pony, gazing at the river while the other chiefs talked. His restless pony pawed the ground. When they fell silent, Tuhulhosot gathered air in his huge chest and shouted. He spoke to the one-armed general, wherever he was. Our great spirit chief made the world, he said. He put me here on this piece of the earth. This earth is my mother. You tell me to live like the white man and plow the land. Shall I take a knife and tear my mother's bosom? You tell me to cut the grass and make hay. But dare I cut off my mother's hair? The spirit chief gave no man the right to tell another man where he must live and where he must die. His voice trailed off. The leader of the white soldiers did not hear him. My father and Chief Olicut, his brother, did not hear him. They did not listen to him, nor did Tall Elk and Ferocious Bear. The decision had been made to cross the river. Now we build rafts for the crossing, my father said. And boats. Gather our herds, Olicut said. More than two hundred cows have been driven off by the whites since we came to the river and half that many horses. We'll lose many more before the sun rises again. We go at dawn, Chief Joseph said. Tuhulhusot's eyes flashed, but he said nothing more. That night we built fires, and by their light made rafts and boats for the crossing of the snake. Men cut alder trees and bound them together with leather thongs. The rafts were strong but hard to handle. The women made bull boats from willow frames and buffalo hides stretched tight. Bull boats look like melons cut in half. They swirl round and round and bob like corks, yet they are safe in the rushing water. As the sun came up, our five bands gathered at the river bank. In my father's band from Olawa, the land of the wandering waters, there were sixty-two warriors and three hundred women, children, and old people. The warriors were naked except for breechcloths. Their bodies were covered with thick bear grease to keep out the cold, and they wore red feathers in their braided hair. Chief Whitebird, who was very old, brought a band that was next in size to my father's band. It had fifty-one warriors and two hundred and fifty-five women, children, and old people. They came from White Bird Canyon beyond the river. Chief Looking Glass was there. He was a great warrior, not as tall as my father. His black braids were streaked with white and their tips wrapped with brass wire. He wore brass rings in his ears. A round looking glass always hung from a rawhide around his neck. Looking Glass brought forty warriors and two hundred women, children, and the old. They had lived peacefully in a small hidden village on the Clearwater River. Yet white miners had found them and treated them badly. They had killed their cattle and stolen their horses. The smallest of our bands belonged to quarrelsome Tuhulhulsot. There were fewer than fifty of these Palooses, but their warriors carried good rifles and were the best buffalo hunters among all the Namipu. The night was long. Gathered on the bank, we waited for the sun. It came up bright and lit the hills where the soldiers were camped. It took a long time, half the morning, for the sun to find its way down the dark canyon walls. 
It lay on the river in shimmering sheets that blinded us. We couldn't see the river because of the fierce light, so the chiefs decided to make the crossing late in the day. When the light changed, Olicott sent out riders to herd the horses close to the river. Chief Joseph stood at one end of the herd, Ferocious Bear stood in the middle, and Olicott on his big stallion stood at the other end. Olicott fired his pistol. The riders shouted. The frightened horses stampeded into the river and swam for their lives. All of them got to the far shore. The cattle were next. Warily they walked into the shallows, but the riders forced them into the river. Half of the cows and all of the spring calves were lost. Olicott sent out rafts loaded with the things we had saved, clothes, ornaments, buffalo robes, lodge skins, packets of gold dust, bags of cow smush, dried berry cakes, camas roots, and smoked meat and salmon wrapped in deerskin. We lost only two rafts. The soldiers watched from the hill, but did not offer to help. The sun moved down in the sky. In its rays, the rushing water sparkled like a river of jewels where Olicott gathered our people. The old women, the old men, and the children were placed on rafts and lashed down. Babies in cradle boards were strapped to their mother's backs. One end of a stout rope was tied around the waist of a horseman, the other end to a corner of a raft. In this way, with a horseman at each corner and the horses plunging against the swift water while their riders clung desperately to their backs, our people crossed the river. Three of us were left to go, Chief Joseph, my mother, and myself. One star shone above us. The dark river turned to silver. I had made a bed of buffalo skin for my mother. It was warm, but she complained of the cold. She got up and wrapped a robe around herself and went down to the river. Fires were burning on the far shore. It is time to go, my father said. Springtime did not answer. She lay down again and pulled the robe over her head. My father got out the last of the bull boats, and I made a bed for my mother in its bottom. He picked her up to put her in the boat, but she slipped from his grasp and went along the bank to a big rock that jutted over the river. This is no time for play, Chief Joseph said. I am not playing, Springtime said. I will have my child here, before we cross the river. This is my home. This is Wallawa. Over there, where the soldiers watch and fires burn, is not our country. It will be our country soon, my father said. It is better that our child be born where his home will be. He edged toward her and talked softly. Her back was against a rocky ledge that hung over the river. He moved closer, talking softly, ready to take her in his arms. The ledge was slippery with spray, and she was heavy, but before he could grasp her, she clawed onto the ledge out of his reach. She sat above the torrent, looking down at him. Her hair was wild with spray. I think that if he had tried to follow my mother, she would have thrown herself into the river. If she had, I would have followed her. How long do you sit? Chief Joseph said. He was not pleased. He was not used to being defied, not by his wife. Already you shiver with cold. You will be sick. The child will be sick. How long does this madness last? Until the child is born, my mother said. After we cross the river, Chief Joseph said, it is yet a march before we come to Lapway, our new home. In my heart, she said, this is my home, not over there on the far side of the river. And in my heart also, I said to her. I said this under my breath, but Chief Joseph heard it. He walked away, gazed for a while at the raging river, then came back. He asked me to build up the fire. In a gentle voice, he spoke to springtime, and she came down from the ledge. As the sky grew light in the east, her child was born. At dawn, we got into the bull boat, and horsemen guided us to the far side. 